That was my disclaimer, Carrie. Excellent, here we go. Good evening, and thank you for joining us. Creation Fellowship in Santee, and now online, has been meeting for 10 years, eight years in person, and presently online for two years. We are a group of people who come together to learn more about the six-day creation account that happened some 6,000 years ago. You can find Creation Fellowship Santee as a public page and a private uh, group on Facebook. You can watch past presentations on our video platforms at YouTube, Rumble, and BitChute by searching Creation Fellowship Santee or just CFS 2020. We often just say CFS. BitChute is the believer's best video platform. We encourage using BitChute. YouTube has now censored two videos and gave me a warning on one. Uh, when you do find us, please subscribe um, and like our videos. If you have questions or would like to get on our emailing list, please send us an email at creationfellowshipsantee at gmail.com. I don't spam. I send out one email a week letting you know who's speaking. And sometimes I'll send out two if there's some really information, really good information. Uh, we're doing a new thing this year. Um, we're partnering with Throughout All Ages Ministry, which uh, is a memory of Joe Guyona, uh, who recently um, passed away. And his wife, Stacy, uh, is now the CEO. Go ahead and Diane, let's go and tell us about uh, Throughout All Ages. Okay, Throughout All Ages Ministries Incorporated 1530 Apologetics goes into the public high schools to build up the student's character, to intellectually think about their worldview and weigh it with truth. So for more information, you can go to throughoutallages.com. You can follow Stacy Gayona on Facebook, and that's spelled S-T-A-C-E-Y, G-A-O-N-A. -A. And you can go to Christ Girl on YouTube to follow her story. All right. Thank you so much, Diane. And now we're going to turn it over to Frank. I'm sorry, Frank. Um, I think everybody knows you. I don't have your bio in front of me. So if you could go ahead and um, tell us a little bit about uh, yourself and then uh, begin your uh, talk. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, my name is Frank Sherwin, just like the paint. I'm born and raised in Chicago and then uh, got my schooling done in Colorado, both as an undergraduate and then after getting my degree in biology and spending five years on a city fire department in North uh, Colorado, I went back to school, got my master's degree in invertebrate zoology with an emphasis in parasitology. And from there, I went to Pensacola and spent nine years uh, teaching at Pensacola Christian College. That's where 75% of my children were born is Pensacola. Then at the end of the ninth year, we moved from Pensacola to right there in San Diego. And I began working in 1996 with the Institute for Creation Research. Uh, at that time when I was in San Diego, ICR paid for a number of classes that I took at UCSD and SDSU, such as a two semesters of molecular pharmacology advanced vertebrate immunology, uh, just a, a host of classes that helped me to fine tune my uh, work and research in zoology specifically. But the big deal of being in San Diego was I um, got to run the San Diego Rock and Roll Marathon and I actually finished and I never stopped and I wasn't last. So that's my claim to fame for uh, San Diego. <laughs> Thank you, Terry. <laughs> and, uh, so I think what we'll do now is look at scientific evidence for creation. Now, the average speaking speed is about 190 words per minute. I clip right along at 350 with gusts up to 400. And as the infamous King Henry VIII of England told his six wives, I won't keep you long. So we'll look at this scientific, <laughs> thank you, scientific evidence for creation. You know, the critics of creation often say that there's no evidence for creation. Creation is either something you believe in or don't believe in. 
However, the Apostle Paul in the first chapter of the book of Romans told us very clearly that God's creation is not only seen, but then Paul added an extra word. He said that God's creation is clearly seen, Romans chapter 1 and verse 20. And so we're going to take a look at that. I'm going to give you kind of an extended introduction to the scientific evidence for creation, make sure that we're reading on the same page, and then we'll jump right into it. So um, let's see. It's not going forward. Oh, there maybe. Go. Oh, great. Right. Okay. Yeah. Good. So when we look at America's membership in houses of worship, it continues to decline last year, dropping below 50% for the first time in Gallup's 80-year trend. Uh, two years ago, 47% of Americans said they belong to a church, synagogue, or mosque. That's down from 50% in 2018 and 70% in 1999. So things are going downhill in a hurry when it comes to uh, houses of worship and even pastors who believe the entire Bible from Genesis to the maps. And by the way, that's a, a requirement for working at ICR. We have to believe that God's word is true from the very first verse, and indeed we do. 72% of Americans polled way, way back in March of the year 2022 uh, said that they don't attend religious services. So statistically, if you go to places like Walmart or somewhere else, three out of every four people that you see don't go to any kind of uh, religious worship services, for example. Uh, I like this quote, it's very sobering, but this individual did his research search in 2016, and he talked about why Americans nuns, if you've heard of that before, the nuns left religion behind. This includes many respondents who mentioned science as the reason they don't believe in religious teaching. When they were pressed for uh, specifics as to why they left Christianity because of science, here are the two most common uh, as statements they made as to the reason why. The first statement was learning about evolution when I went away to college. And then the second one is doubly tragic because they said there's, no la there's a lack of any sort of scientific or specific evidence of a creator. This might take you back to Romans chapter 1, verse 20, where Paul makes it very clear that God's creation is clearly seen. Well, I like this. Uh, this was said way back in the year 2022. And this individual said, why does Earth support life while Venus and Mars, and for all we know, any other planet in the universe, do not? Then he said this very revealing statement. It's one of the most fundamental questions in all of science. Why are we here? Why are we here? Well, if you are a Christian, then you know very well why we're here. But these are the same, this is the same question that has been asked through the centuries. Why am I here? Why are we here? And we understand that the Word of God, the Bible, has a very clear answer to that. Well, it gets into, for example, the evolution of life. It certainly is not clearly seen. This is one of my favorite quotes. I have no idea who said it, but it works for me. And here's what they said. The evolution of life is a faith that unknown chemicals came together in an unknown way, at an unknown place, at an unknown time, using an unknown process to produce life. And this is why evolution is taught as a fact in American taxpayer paid public schools, because everything about, for example, the evolution of life is unknown. And so, as we say in Texas, I'm against it. I'm against it. I'm against teaching the next generation coming through the schools that they came from a fish. I think instead they should be taught some really good science and leave the religion in the philosophy department. Well, evolution certainly is religion, as this quote you can see from just last year. It was by a researcher by the name of Musser, and Musser had 13 other evolutionists writing this article in Science Magazine, volume 374. And you can see what they said. Sponges represent our distant animal relatives. I cannot tell you how ridiculous that statement is. It's not logical. 
It's certainly not scientific. And tragically, it is strictly anti-biblical. But this is what they're saying, that this uh, sponge is your distant evolutionary relative. Now, as an invertebrate zoologist, uh, I like studying sponges like this, and you can just see the incurrent and the excurrent canals. It kind of takes on the shape of a face. So this is, this is not Photoshop or anything else. It's just how it looks. However, it should remind you of something. And uh, so, yeah, but uh, again, when the evolutionists are worried that creationists might get in there in the science classroom and teach religion, it's okay. Religion is already there. Whenever they say really irresponsible statements like sponges represent our distant animal relative, there's absolutely no scientific validation for that at all. Well, I love this quote, and I decided to add it very quickly. And this is a quote by an individual who's now dead, but I certainly agree with what he said. A fair result can be obtained only by fully stating and balancing the facts and arguments on both sides of each question. I don't know about you, but I am in 100% agreement with this individual. I truly believe that a fair result can only be obtained by still fully stating and balancing the facts, et cetera. Well, the question is, who said this statement? Who said this? It so clearly shows that both sides should be balanced and weighed. I think the answer might surprise you. It's none other than Charles Darwin. That's right. Charles Darwin said that. Uh, when I was living in San Diego, I was sent to go to a very small, cramped studio in downtown San Diego. I had literally seconds to spare. I got to that studio, sat down. Uh, the individual was behind the camera. The light went on, and I was talking to Lou Dobbs on CNN Live. And it, this is back in the um, uh, late 90s. And uh, I found that I was debating an evolutionist, a very unpleasant individual. And so I kicked off my side of the story by using this quote. And, and uh, I think it's very, very apropos. So millions of people on the Lou Dobbs Live were able to see this quote attributed to Charles Darwin. So I really emphasize that a lot. This is especially true when it comes to American taxpayer paid public schools. I think since our tax dollars are being used to teach the next generation, the students should hear both sides of the story. Now, what I'm not saying is they should hear about biblical creation. I'm not saying that, but I am saying very clearly that the students should hear the problems with evolution. That's not teaching creation. So when a teacher says that you came from a fish, the teacher would it would be important that the students understand that there's real scientific problems with saying that people came from fish, let alone any other creature. And again, without being redundant, the, this is our tax dollars at work. So we must build our worldview on the Bible. Now I'm talking as, as Christians, and I'm not talking about uh, uh, public schools. We as Christians, we who name the name of Christ, should build our worldview on the Bible. And certainly, Genesis is the true origins account. Some people think Genesis is just a story, but I hasten to add that all 50 chapters are written in the historical narrative Hebrew. In other words, that includes the first critical 11 chapters of this book of beginnings, the book of Genesis. And so we believe the Bible at ICR to be true from the very first verse. We believe that the Bible and science, by that I mean empirical science, go together just like butter and bread. Science and the Bible are inextricably linked, uh, absolutely inseparable, just like politics and corruption. And so we believe that the Bible is certainly true and that it mirrors what science and scientific investigation and research, and that there is no problem between the two. First Peter 3.15 is something that my wife and I taught our four children as they were growing up, both in Pensacola and then later in San Diego, that sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer. That is the word apologia, an apologetic to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and with fear. Such a critically important verse in this sin-sick society of which we now live. 
we should be able to stand up, be bold in our faith, be bold in the Lord, draw upon him and say that, yeah, yeah, uh, we have been created in God's image, Genesis chapter two. In other words, we should be able to know why we believe what we believe. Do you believe in creation? Wonderful, that's commendable. Now, why do you believe in creation as opposed to the strange theory that says we came from invertebrates like sponges millions of years ago? We also uh, agree at ICR, the empty tomb. What's so unique about Christianity? Well, there's a number of things, obviously. The first and foremost is the very first verse of the Bible. It begins like no other religious writing in the world. When you talk to a cosmologist, she or he will tell you we live in a universe. And it doesn't matter how secular the cosmologist is. They would certainly say that we live in a universe composed of time and space and matter. Maybe you've heard it said, a time, space, matter universe. Now, why is that significant? Well, because in the beginning, that's time. God created the heavens, that's space, and the earth, matter. So in the very first verse of the first book of the book of books, we find God who has always existed speaking into existence. We call that an ex nihilo creation, the time, space, matter, universe. And by the way, we live in a universe, not a multiverse. What does the prefix uni mean? That's right, one. So it's time, space, and matter, three in a universe one three and one i think that's kind of interesting and so we also teach of course that jesus christ is the way the truth and the life and that no one comes to the father except through jesus christ and what else makes christianity unique besides how the bible begins well it's the empty tomb we worship a uh, the god who is there that is victorious over the grave Jesus Christ rose physically, and I emphasize the word physically, from the dead, showing once and for all that he is God in the flesh. Sometimes philosophers wring their hands and say, we could never know what God's like. I disagree. If you study the life of Jesus Christ, you will know exactly what God is like, because he's God in the flesh. So what is science? I think that we should emphasize this as creation scientists. We shouldn't be afraid of science by any means. We understand that science is a way of thinking God's thoughts after him. And science is a systematic study of phenomena based on experimental investigation. Again, we have no problem with that uh, with ICR. We understand that empirical science is that which we can observe, test, and repeat. Indeed, at least 70% of empirical science is observation, looking at a phenomena and taking notes. We certainly have no problem with that at ICR. Empirical science is observation, testing, repeating, and falsifiable as well. And so I always emphasize the definition of science because the critics of creation sometimes say that we never define what science is. So there you go. I like this quote from a former atheist. He's not an atheist anymore because he died a couple of years ago, but his name was Linus Pauling. He did a lot of research in vitamin C and he said, science is the search for truth. I agree with that. I really agree with that. Science is a search for truth, the effort to understand the world. Here in the 21st century, we find a lot of secular individuals who are engaged in the field of science who feel that science is subjective, science is relative. Hey man, what's true for you may not be true for me. And some are even more cynical and say the truth doesn't even exist, which I just, I, I'm, I'm flabbergasted because why would that individual be in a field of science if she or he doesn't believe that, science, that the, the truth exists since science is a search for truth. And so, Conversely, I find as a creation scientist, as an invertebrate zoologist, it is eminently satisfying to think God's thoughts after him, to do research, to do investigation, knowing that Jesus is the way and the, that's right, the truth and the life, and that the Lord Jesus Christ is the truth. And so 
to do research and investigation. We are thinking God's thoughts after him. As a matter of fact, let me emphasize that doing scientific research from a creation science perspective is a form of worship. It's a form of worship. And so we enjoy that very much at ICR. So with that in mind, empirical science, let's look at this quote by Paul Sutter, no friend of the creationist by any stretch in the imagination. And he said this amazing statement, quote, at 13.8 billion years ago, our entire observable universe was the size of a peach and had the temperature of over a trillion degrees. And is this empirical science? Can we observe, test, and repeat what happened 13.8 billion years ago? I think not. And so this is nothing more than a statement, a hypothesis. And uh, if pushed, I would simply ask the question, Dr. Sutter, how do you know that? How do you know that it wasn't 13.6 billion years ago or 14 billion years ago? And how do you know it was the size of a peach and that kind of temperature if it happened so, so long ago? In other words, that was a one-time event that occurred in the unobserved past. Let me repeat that. That was a one-time event that occurred in the unobserved past. Now, the atheist will turn that around and say, well, what about Genesis chapter one? That was a one-time event that occurred in the unobserved past. I certainly agree with that. So do both of these statements take faith? Yes, they do. But there is one big difference. And that is ours is a more reasonable faith. The biblical position is more reasonable faith. Why is that? Because the atheist says, in the beginning, nothing. The atheist has to begin with absolutely nothing and then start from there. We begin with God, who has always existed. Now, that may not sound very scientific, but to say, in the beginning, nothing, and we've got everything from nothing, how scientific is that? Can we put on a white lab coat? go into a laboratory, 20, 21st century laboratory, and show how something can come from absolutely nothing? Obviously, we can't do that. So although it is true, both uh, positions require faith, we uh, have to understand that ours is a more reasonable faith. And uh, the evolutionist has to have their faith ultimately in nothing. Well, let's look at our created cosmos and understand that there's only three options for the origin of this universe. Number one is it always existed. Now there's a big thermodynamic problem with that. If it always existed, it already would have burned up in what we call a heat death. And so that doesn't work. Door number two, it suddenly appeared from nothing. And door number three, it was created supernaturally. Now, the evolutionists are caught on the horns of the dilemma. They certainly understand that it couldn't have always existed, and they aren't about to uh, become a creationist or something like that and say it was created supernaturally. So the only option they have is door number two. It suddenly appeared from, and this is what I talked about a, just a minute or two ago, from nothing. And I want to share with you a quote by the wonder kid of the, uh, uh, of the expanding universe. His name is uh, Alan Guth out of MIT. And Alan Guth said this in the mid-1980s. He might have well have said it this morning. But he said, it is then tempting to go one step further and speculate, there's a good scientific word, speculate that the entire universe evolved from literally nothing. So there you have it from Alan Guth who's no creationist, but he's forced to say everything came from nothing. That takes a lot more faith than I have. I put my faith in the one who was there when? In the beginning. In the beginning. So God has given us tools for inquiry, hasn't he? First of all, he's given us that three-pound brain that's currently holding your ears apart. That three-pound brain is the most sophisticated accumulation of matter in the known universe. Our three-pound brain, the most sophisticated accumulation of matter in the known universe, we will never, ever, ever understand the brain. It is too complex. It's too sophisticated. They're always finding out more and more about the brain. Even the neurons, the nerve cells that make up the brain, 
with its thousands of sodium potassium pumps uh, that are pumping sodium to potassium out in a two to three ratio. It's, it's really a, an, an amazing, amazing accumulation of matter. So God has given us logic, logic in this three pound brain, but he has also given, as you see in the picture there, observation. So using logic and observation, those are the tools of inquiry that God has blessed us with, that God has given us. And I would dare to say that uh, sometime today, you have used both logic and observation a bunch of times. And these are the tools that God has given us. Well, I like how earth is designed. We all do as Christians. We acknowledge a creator who designed the earth. And um, evolutionists like to say, we inhabit no unique place in the universe. And I have several quotes of leading evolutionists who say that. And you can see the hope that they have. I hope, I hope, I hope we inhabit no unique place in the universe. Because if we did, that would imply some kind of supernatural placement. And they certainly don't want that. But decades ago, this book, it's, it's a dated book, but it still has great quotes. It will never really go out of date. It's called Rare Earth, and it's by two atheists. These two individuals, Ward and Brownlee, had no theological axe to grind. But they showed in this book, this significant book, why complex life is uncommon in the universe. Again, evolutionists, atheists want to say that, oh, life is just brimming over all over the universe. Well, we certainly have not seen that yet. And I would predict we'll never see uh, organic life, uh, sophisticated organic life anywhere else in the universe. It's just, it's just not there. So these uh, two secular authors beg to differ with what atheists say in the above quote there about no unique place in the universe. Earth is very special according to this well-researched book. And here are some examples. I didn't know this until a couple of years ago, but Earth has just the right rotation. Not too fast, not too slow. As Goldilocks says, it's just right. And this is another Goldilocks problem for astrobiologists to consider. Not only do you have to have a planet that's not too close to a star, but not too far away, but it's got to be in the proper orbit. It's got to be rotating at the right speed. It's got to have something like the moon that is also orbiting the planet, just as the moon and planet is what we call a binary, is orbiting the star. And for in our, our case with the Earth, we orbit the star called the sun every 365 days. But while that's happening, our moon is also orbiting the earth, giving us uh, a very, very important physical parameters. So here we have the habitable zone. Uh, planet size, as you see here with the earth, is just right. It's in the green zone, not too hot and not too cold. But what about our moon? Our moon, as it turns out, is just the right size, just the right distance, just the right ro rotational velocity, just the right density. There is everything about the moon that has to be not just right, but exactly right. And that's what we find. Two atheists wrote a book about the moon, quoting all these parameters I just listed for you. And once again, these two different atheists had no theological ax to grind. But they are giving you all sorts of statistics about how unique the moon is. Finally, when it came to giving a title for this book, they had to be intellectually honest. They had to be intellectually honest and simply say in the title of the book, who built the moon? Do you remember I said in Romans chapter one, how the apostle Paul said that God's creation is not only seen, but it's clearly seen, this is a perfect example. This book by two atheists, who, by the way, denigrate Christians and creationists in this book. They want to make sure that nobody thinks they're Christians. But Paul says God's creation is clearly seen, and it's clearly seen when two atheists give the title to the book, Who Built the Moon? They could have said what, but they said no, the moon is simply too specific. There's so many parameters parameters about the moon that are so spot on, somebody had to have built it. Ergo, Romans 1.20. 
its unusual size and especially its earth-like chemical composition have always been a mystery uh, that this individual said very recently. It's unusual size, earth-like chemical composition, everything is just exactly right. And by the way, the origin of the moon remains enigmatic. That was said here in the 21st century, the puzzling origin of the moon. And by the way, they have been finding insects on the moon. A lot of people don't know they found insects on the moon. Scientists are calling them lunatics. Thank you, thank you. And so again, we look at the cover of this book, the title, and we can clearly see how. Frank? Yes. Was Hello. that really a was that really a joke, or do that, they find insects? that was a joke? Lunatics. Okay, I will not put that in the question then. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay. So anyway, no life without the moon. Life on Earth would not be possible without the moon. It keeps our planet's axis of rotation stable which controls seasons and regulates our climate. Now, this is said in the secular evolutionary publication, Physorg. It's, it's online. It, has, it is no connection to any church or religious group. And they said this just two short years ago. You need the moon to have life on Earth. And so it, life simply wouldn't be possible without the moon. And the moon just happens to be absolutely specific and, and uh, it even helps to maintain the orbital uh, velocity and the, 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 um, the, how the, the Earth is at a certain tilt and all that has to do with the moon. Well, let's take a giant step away from that and look at biology, the biological sciences and understand that there is horizontal variation. For example, in people, we see horizontal variation. That's not evolution. That is simply uh, variation that we see within the created kind, people created in Genesis chapter two. And so we have no problem with that. So we see horizontal variation in people and in plants, for example, roses. There are approximately 13,000 identifiable varieties, that is cultivated hybrids of roses throughout the world. And please note, they're all 100% roses. So the roses are not becoming any other kind of plant. God has built into the roses a lot, a lot of genetic variability. But again, it's always a rose. And so we would call that horizontal variation, just like the horizontal variation we see in people. So people and plants, we see it all the time. We see this observable kind of minor change. And that's all we see. We don't see, for example, uh, macroevolution. Now, at this point, evolutionists will say, wait a minute, what about this? And now, this is not a Photoshop. This is an actual picture. The mom is seen over there on the left-hand side, and Junior is seen in the center of the picture. Look at the socks that Junior is wearing, okay? And uh, you can tell that uh, mom is a zebra, and the dad is not there, but the dad is a, a mule. And so we find that this creature is what they call a zonkey. It's half, a, it's half donkey and half a zebra. So they call it a zonkey, not a mule. And so this is, a, this is a zonkey. Is this an example of evolution? And the answer is no. This is an example of minor variation within the horse kind. Minor variation within the horse kind. And I've been with ICR for decades. Never once have I heard evolutionists bring this up as an example of evolution. They know what creationists know, and that is, this is just a variation of the horse kind. So horizontal variation in animals, well, what about this? This is a liger, cross between a tiger and a lion. And this is a half a ton kitty. I believe they're both dead now, but they're uh, they were very, very big, about a half ton, 1,000 pounds. And um, again, they were a variation of the cat kind between the lion and the tiger. And so even evolutionists admit, no, this is not real evolution. This is just a variation of the, of the cat kind. So again, this is horizontal variation in animals. So we can say this evening that there's horizontal variation, absolutely, in people, 
plants and animals. But there's no vertical evolution. And that's what the de debate is. The debate today in the 21st century is, did we come from a fish? Do we, um, is this evolutionary progression fr from uh, bacteria, the quote unquote simple forms of life to people and dinosaurs and everything else, uh, is that a fact? And of course it is not a fact. It's not observable, testable, repeatable science. What we do see is the horizontal variation. We get all sorts of varieties going on. So we find created after their kind. Some of my favorite animals are the puppy dogs. When we were living in California, we had a canardly dog. You can hardly tell what kind of dog it was. But that was a joke. And so when we look at the varieties of dogs, we see the big dogs, the small dogs. You can see, uh, for example, those huge Mexican chihuahuas, those little bitty Great Danes, and everything in between, even horribly mutated dogs like poodles. So whether they're cold dogs or hot dogs, we find that dogs have always been what? That's right, dogs have always been dogs. And so there's all sorts of varieties of dogs that we can investigate and research and look into, but they're always dogs. How about this? What kind of dog is this? Well, this is a Labrador Retriever. This is the most popular dog in Canada, the United States, England, Wales, Scotland, all these countries. This is the most popular dog, the Labrador Retriever. How many different kinds do we have? Well, we have the Golden Lab. We have the Black Lab. And what's the last one? That's right, we have the chocolate lab. And so labs have always been labs. We find varieties of labs, but always labs. So right here in the great state of Texas, we have some neighbors that live uh, nearby. And uh, although we have the gold lab, black lab, and the uh, chocolate lab, we're pretty sure they have a meth lab. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> the, okay, good, the meth lab. And so, <laughs> But uh, thank you, Jerry. So uh, here's the question of the evening. Where did domestic dogs come from? That's the question. Where did domestic dogs come from? Well, obviously, uh, you would think that that's, that's a no-brainer, but evolutionists do not know where the domestic dogs came from, and I emphasize that. As a matter of fact, Michael Benton, he's an English atheist, a vertebrate paleontologist, I have read his book cover to cover several times on vertebrate paleontology, and he said in regard to dogs, he said the history of today's dogs is still contentious. He said that in 2015, but uh, <laughs> leave that as it may, in 2022, just two short years ago, Science Daily, which is no friend of the creationist, said, but where the dog comes from and how old various groups of dogs are is still a bit of a mystery. They still don't know. Now, this is the thing that I want to emphasize here this evening very quickly, and that is the evolutionists believe we came from a sponge. And you saw at least 15 evolutionists in that quote from Science Magazine that said, yes, yes, uh, a sponge is our evolutionary ancestor. Now, they're willing to say that, but they don't know where dogs came from. And we have all these dogs that we can study over and over again. So although they believe we came from a sponge, they have a, a terrible time trying to define and describe where dogs came from. That just doesn't add up. So here's the question uh, in my presentation. Is it really possible to talk honestly and fairly about scientific evidence for creation? Well, I believe it is because the Apostle Paul said in Romans 1.20 that God's creation is not only seen, but it's clearly seen. And so the answer is clearly yes. And so just in the remaining minutes we have uh, here this evening, uh, let's look at my field, which is biology. And I like what the psalmist said in Psalm 111, the works of the Lord are great, sought out of all them that have pleasure therein. And we're going to see some of the works of the Lord. Certainly design means a designer, creation means a creator, and things looks like they were architecturally made, there must be an architect, exactly. So this is uh, the, I guess I, you would call this the poster child of the creation science movement, and that is the flagellum, the rotary flagellum. Do you see those whip-like appendages there, those threads? 
Well, what we want to do, looking at this bacterial cell, the famous E. coli, of which there are dozens and dozens of sub varieties of E. coli, this is not the E. coli you find in your large intestine. The E. coli in our large intestine only makes up about 1% of our biome. But um, the, uh, some of the free living E. coli on the environment have these flagella that helps it to move around. And the, the flagella actually twist, they twix, twist very, very rapidly. What scientists have done is to look how the flagella goes into the cell wall of the bacterium. And by the way, this picture is an electron micrograph. They actually had to magnify a single E. coli bacteria, bacterium hundreds and hundreds of times, if not thousands of times, to blow up and see what this E. coli bacteria looks like. And as we look at these whip-like proje uh, projections, we're going to look and see how it actually fits into just take a look at any one of them there and see how it fits into the side of the bacterial cell. So let's do that now. Let's blow up just one little section there, how the flagellum goes in the side and see what it looks like. And here it is. Do you see that grainy white and black picture there on the right hand side of the screen? That's an electron micrograph of the flagellum. The reason why it's grainy and kind of unclear is because it had to be magnified almost 1 million times. So obviously you don't get the degree of detail that you would like. And so what the uh, illustrators have done is you can see on the left-hand side of the screen, a very clear and sharp image. That's because it's an artist's rendition. And I would say it's 99% correct. I have no problem with that. And you can see how the flagellar motor is hooked into the bacterial cell wall. And then the flagellum itself goes into the motor there. So this is an amazing, amazing bit of natural technology designed by the master engineer, the Lord Jesus Christ. So what I want to do very quickly is compare and contrast the flagellar motor that you see there, that white and black picture, to a designed, well-designed um, uh, axle that you would find on the 18-wheeler truck. So there on the left-hand side of the screen, you see an axle. And this axle, obviously, evolutionists and creationists would agree that that axle of the 18-wheeler is designed. Of course, it's designed. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, my son is a mechanical engineer, got his degree in Baylor. And this is the kind of thing that he does in Detroit. So this is designed. And what I want to do is compare this with a flagellar motor that's a million times smaller. And evolutionists say, although the axle is designed, no, the flagellum is not designed. Why are they saying that? Because of their philosophy. Their philosophy says design means a designer. And they can't have that because that designer would lead them to the Lord Jesus Christ. And they simply will not accept that. And so we would say, as Christians, as believing that in the beginning God created and the Lord Jesus Christ is the creator, he not only created this flagellar motor, but in Genesis chapter one, he created the stars also. So all the trillions upon trillions of stars you see out there in the universe, the Lord Jesus created every last one of those and has given them a name. And so let's look at the uh, flagellar motor as compared to the axle of an 18-wheeler. And we find that they both have a drive shaft. They both have bushing. They both have a universal joint. These are names that the evolutionists themselves have given to the flagellar motor that we saw in the previous picture. They both have a rotor. They both have rings. And get this, they both have a clutch. You mean this flagellar motor that you have to magnify a million times as a clutch? Yes, the National Science Foundation, an overtly evolutionary organization, did some research about 10 plus years ago. Here's what they found. The flagellar clutch can be engaged and disengaged so that the flagellum can move or not move. God has actually designed this flagellar motor in this tiny bacterial cell that using a high school or college light microscope, you're barely able to see at high power, that is 100X. God has placed 
a, a clutch in this incredible, incredible uh, a flagellar motor. It's just amazing what they have been describing. I look at this flut, uh, this, this clutch of this flagellar motor and the hair in the back of my neck goes up because I realize we are seeing the very fingerprints of the creator, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Now, the Apostle Paul certainly didn't know about this, but Paul said, because he'd look at the things like the sunrise and the sunset, he would look at his hand, he would look at the, the, the structure and function of birds and fish, and he would say God's creation is clearly seen. Here we are over 2,000 years later, we have all this technology at our disposal, we certainly have no excuse whatsoever to see that here we have the clearly designed features that come from the master designer, the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, this is the motor system inside, inside this tiny bacterial cell that you can barely see with a light microscope. So in time, inside this tiny bacterium that has this flagellar motor, you've got the motor system. And the motor system just doesn't run willy nilly. It needs to have an entire system with which to run. And so you have the rotary mechanism, you have the switch that makes it go clockwise or counterclockwise. It can change uh, clockwise to counterclockwise within a fraction of a millisecond. There's assembly, regu regulation, coordinate synthesis, it goes with the regulation, bundle formation, energy, perturbation, signal switches, tumble regulator, all of that, all of that is going on inside this impossibly tiny bacterial cell. But wait a minute. It's, only, it's good to have a motor system, but how does the bacteria know where to go and where not to go? The bacteria certainly doesn't want to go in an aqueous environment that is uh, very uh, acidic, that has a low pH. And so it has going to have to turn around and go in the opposite direction to avoid that acidic, that low pH. How does it know to do that? Well, the answer is it's got to be designed with a what? With a sensory system. So now you've got this sensory system that's going on at the same time, exactly the same time as the motor system. This sensory system is not it's simple at all. It's very, very complex, as you can see from this diagram. So you've got all of this, plus a lot more that's going on inside of this tiny bacterial cell that has these dozen or so molecular motors that attach to the flagellum. So let's go ahead and superimpose the sensory system with the motor system just to show all of this that's going on inside this tiny bacterial cell. Now we begin to appreciate the complexity that's going on there. So we have the motor system and we have the sensory system all by complex biochemical pathways. You've got that flagellar motor that's moving with the complex clutch and everything else. Oh, I forgot to mention, you got to have the DNA. It's a circular chromosome that's super coiled. Do you remember those old time phone cords that you, you if you're if you're younger than 50, you don't know about these old time phone cords that we had before cell phones. But these phone cords were kind of like super coiled. And that's how the Lord Jesus has designed the circular DNA molecule inside the E. coli cell that we've been talking about. It's a super coiled DNA molecule, but it has to duplicate itself. And it duplicates itself, we call it replication, within just 25 minutes. So you have one very super coiled DNA molecule that's spinning and spinning, and these nucleotides are coming alongside and making a second uh, DNA circular chromosome that is error free, no errors. So all of that is going on at the same time. You have the sensory system, the motor system, the molecular, uh, the molecular motor with the clutch. And oh, I forgot, there also has to have energy. And so when this bacterial cell is moving, it's got to undergo a process called glycolysis in biochemistry. I used to teach it at Pensacola Christian College. Glyco is a carbohydrate. Lysis means to break. So glycolysis means to break carbohydrates like a six carbon sugar. And so that's what happens inside this very tiny bacterial cell. You have a six carbon sugar that's broken into two energy rich three carbon sugars. 
then those two energy rich three carbon units go through the pyruvate dehydrogenase system. And one of the carbons is cleaved off and the, uh, the hydrogens that are on these three carbons are cleaved off by a special kind of enzyme called nicotinamine adenine dinucleotide phosphate. And that carries it to a special system where we find that adenosine diphosphate is phosphorylated into adenosine triphosphate. <laughs> and from there, it starts getting really complex. So we can see that the Apostle Paul is spot on and certainly God's creation is clearly seen looking at the tiny bacterial cell. Well, this guy was Francis Crick. He was a co-discoverer of the DNA molecule back in the early 1950s. He was born and raised and went through his entire life as an atheist. And uh, he's not anymore because he died in, in 2004. But Francis Crick was dead, death on Christians and creationists. And, and he simply would not even consider it but he would run into philosophical problems. As he said in his 1988 book, and I quote, biologists must constantly keep in mind that what they see was not designed, but rather evolved. Now, did you get that? In other words, Paul is right. God's creation is clearly seen. So, it, so people like Crick, the atheist, or should I say former atheist, says, you know, we have to just keep reminding ourselves it wasn't designed, it wasn't designed. And you almost see them grabbing each other by their white lab coats and bouncing them up and down and saying, it evolved, right? It evolved. Yes, it evolved. And they're trying to convince each other that these systems that we just went through last, you know, two minutes ago, all came about by time and chance and natural processes. That's the stuff of evolution. But when we look at that bacterial cell, we can't help but see plan and purpose and special creation. And so no wonder Francis Crick went through his life saying, nope, nope, it evolved, it evolved, it wasn't designed. He just could not consider God in any manner, shape, or form. And so I would leave you with this presentation seeing that yes, indeed, God's creation is clearly seen and we get to know who the creator is, the Lord Jesus Christ who came to earth 2000 years ago to live among us, to say the most incredible things that have ever been said and do the most amazing things that have ever been done. And then finally proving to the world once and for all that he was God in the flesh when he rose physically from the dead. We worship a risen savior and someday he's coming back soon. He's coming back in power and in glory. And he's mentioned first as the creator in Revelation and then the redeemer. But we who name the name of Christ look forward to that day. And we can't help but tell others, our neighbors, our friends, our coworkers, about this great creator savior who has paved the way to heaven for us by his shed blood. If you don't know Jesus this evening, I pray you would come to know him someday by bowing your head, admitting you're a, sin a, a sinner, and receiving Christ into your life and being wonderfully and marvelously born again, as it says in John chapter three. God help you to do it. That's all I have. Oh, okay. Well, I'm just like, okay. <laughs> that was awesome. Um, so I do have a few questions. Most of them are mine. Okay. Usually the case. Um, and we're going to just ask these questions um, while we're recording. And then Terry, as soon as uh, Frank answers the last question that I asked, we'll turn off live stream and recording. Are, are, okay. there, any, are there any questions in uh, Facebook Live? No, not so far, but I'll let you know if any come up before we're done with, with the questions here. Okay. Um, Bill's iPhone, apparently Bill didn't want to talk, but his iPhone does. Um, how does the atheist explain how the first atom formed? How did protons, electrons, and neutrons come together and form the first atom? Thank you. Oh. Yeah, yeah that's a very good question. I'm glad that he asked that question because the atheist must believe and I emphasize that word, 
believe that everything came from nothing. And so too often Christians think that the atheist stock answer to our origins is in the Big Bang. And that's not correct. The Big Bang does not even come close to explaining the origin of the universe. The Big Bang only explains or tries to explain. It doesn't do a very good job of it. I won't get into the physics of that, but, but um, the Big Bang only attempts to explain the expansion of the universe, not the origin of the universe. So far, it's a big question mark for the atheists, and I'm not criticizing them. I, I pray that they come to know the knowledge of Christ, you know, come to know to Christ. Um, um, there is no knowledge of how the universe came about to begin with before the Big Bang. In other words, the philosophical question is, what happened five minutes before the Big Bang? And so they, they still don't know what happened. They, they hope that they would have some kind of answer to that. They don't so far. So um, I'm just expanding on Bill's iPhone's question. I thought, you know, if you listen to people who try to shove their science down your throat, that the Big Bang um, explains everything. No, so all it, it does not. Okay. All right. So some people don't even know what the Big Bang uh, even means, and they're throwing it out there. And yeah. then so the, basically what they're saying is in in the beginning was a, a a quantum fluctuation that's what they say a quantum fluctuation this quantum fluctuation whatever that is got so unstable that it blew up and that's the big bang but what where did that quantum fluctuation whatever that is where did that come from and and that's that's always going to be a problem for the atheist ah. And how do sec, uh, sec, blah, 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 blah. how do secular people scientifically explain the difference between a living dog and a dead dog? Are they not identically physically, biologically, and chemically? Oh, absolutely not. You know, we worship the risen Savior. The Apostle Paul addresses this in Acts chapter 14 and Acts chapter 17 when he talks to the Epicureans and Stoics. Uh, he, he said that we worship not a God, uh, you know, a dead God of, of wood or stone, but he says, he, he used three words, the Apostle Paul, the living God. Now, that's what Paul said 2,000 years ago, and we would echo that, the oh, living no, God. Oh, no, dog. I, I, think, I think the question oh, that dog. Bill, Bill, I, yeah, I know you've got that backwards, right? You have a little bit of dyslexia. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not dyslex, dyslexic, but uh, okay. So what about the dogs? Um, okay, so a, li a live dog and a dead dog are essentially the same. How does a secularist um, differentiate between the two other than using the word dead? Since they're, they are physically, chemically, et cetera, the same. I, I think the question here is, does an, uh, is, is the soul. Yeah, I, I'm, the, the question yeah. reads exactly, how do secular people scientifically explain the difference between a living dog and a dead dog? Are they not identically physically, biologically, and chemically? Well, yeah, you know, basically, uh, and that could, you could say that about a, a person or amoeba or a blue whale or any other, you know, living creature, as we have that life force, we have something that it, it, the difference between those dead chemicals that, that are arranged specifically in a in a cadaver uh what's missing is that that life energy that life force and some and and so you know that that's about all i could say about that um uh animal i think it, so, wouldn't it the that god breathed life into us um, yes, exactly. Yeah, and so and back in the early chapters of Genesis, Genesis chapter two, um, yeah, God breathed in life. So that's that that would be correct. I should keep in uh, we should keep in mind that animals are in heaven. Why would I say that? Well, in the book of Revelation, Jesus is returning on what? A horse. There we go. There we go. So there are celestial stables. <laughs> but you know, there's that's a very controversial topic. Yeah, I, I'm sure it is. Yeah. And and so. today, um, my my colleague had to put his dog down, and he was very sad because his, oh, yeah. his wife passed away, and now her dog passed away, 
And I told him, I said, oh, well, Jackie's probably telling Daisy, how do you do? And it's not something that I, I 100% believe, but I was just trying to encourage him. Yeah, yeah. Well, good for you. Yeah, that's always difficult. And, and God has given us that, you know, that, that love that we have for, for animals. And, and uh, we do. We have a very sincere and deep love for animals. And I believe that's given to us by the Lord. So. Okay, and then my question is, what is your take on the multiverse? And I ask that because um, I, I, I followed this one program and it's called, um, uh, I can't remember the name of it. I watch it every week, Into the, Multiver Into the Multiverse. And Into the, oh, yeah. Mockingbird? No, Multiverse. Oh, Mul <laughs> okay, Multiverse, yes. As, as one cosmologist said, I believe his name is Carr, C-A-R-R, -R, the cosmologist, he says, if you don't want God, then you better hope for a multiverse. And that says everything. Uh, a multiverse is inextricably linked with something called string theory. If you really get down to it, and I, I'm not a physicist, so I, I cannot go into a lot of detail, but basically the multiverse concept is a philosophical construct. The evolutionist, the atheist have put it together to get out from under the thumb of God. And so what do they say? Well, this universe that we're inhabiting right now just happens to be one of many millions of universes out there. Just like bubbles on pond, bubbles upon bubbles, as you see, you know, when you get, uh, and when a you know, washing machine overflows, you see all those suds, all those bubbles, those are like individual uh, uh, universes. That's the analogy. And, and so uh, Carr says, if you don't want God, then you better have a multiverse. And so that's the easiest way to explain the multiverse theory. It's, yes. it's a philosophical requirement for those who don't, do not want God. Okay, thank you. Um, and then I made a comment, um, are there any strawberry labs? I said there was a meth lab, but I didn't see strawberry lab. Yeah, I'm going to add that. I like that. I'm going to add, add to it. Strawberry I like that too. <laughs> and then I have one more question that I asked. Why does the bacterial motor need to avoid the pH area? The pH area. Well, because uh, if you have a low pH, that means a concentration of hydrogen ions that might cause proteins to uh, degrade. And for example, when you uh, crack an egg on a hot skillet, you find that the white portion is just pure protein and then it turns white. Those are the proteins that are being degraded and, and messed up. And so um, that's what the, uh, the bacteria has to do is avoid areas that are not conducive for life. You know, we have a pH in our body of about 7.3, 7.4. And uh, so living things need uh, to have a, a pH that is somewhere around seven, that is neutral. Now there are some very extreme exceptions to that. And that gets into special kinds of life forms called extremophiles that can exist in very, very hot temperatures. Like for example, bacteria living in geysers in, in, in uh, Yellowstone National Park. Uh, that gets into a whole different area there. So, yeah, but uh, we look at a bacterial cell that has this, uh, these organelles for, for locomotion, we are just absolutely flabbergasted at how they're able to move and also avoid one area that's not conducive, that's not hospitable for another area where they could perhaps find food like amino acids and all. Um, I drink pH balance water. Do you think that makes any difference? None at all. Save your money. Don't don't buy pH balance water anymore. Water is water. Um, please. Uh. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's it's like, for example, buying these uh, Gatorade and you know these the electrolyte drinks. I used to teach my students. I taught anatomy and physiology. Don't spend your money buying Gatorade where you're just paying for uh, a fancy label and uh, food coloring. Uh, instead, get a glass of water and eat a bag of potato chips, and you'll get all the electrolytes that you need. Interesting. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, Terry, did we have any questions on Facebook Live? Nope, no questions on Facebook Live. Okay, so then we're uh, going to go ahead <laughs> and um, end the live stream and the recording.
Before we do that, um, shall we ask Frank how people can find him? Oh, yes. Thank you for yeah. the reminder. I was not prepared today at all, Frank. Uh, I had two <laughs> weeks off and I've oh, been traveling. Okay. Um, well, so if fine. you, okay, go ahead and advertise. And then that way um, people can find your, uh, I know several of our attendees like to look at your materials. So go ahead and yeah. give us- Yeah, uh, last name Sherwin, just like to paint, S-H-E-R-W-I-N. If you want to contact me, uh, just go to icr.org. ICR, Institute for Creation Research, just those three letters, icr.org. And then you can go on the search bar and, and uh, I have a number of articles that I've written. I, read, uh, I write uh, two articles a week, at least, and sometimes more. And um, I guess I'm on YouTube too. I, I refuse to look at myself on YouTube, but if you uh, go to YouTube, type in Frank Sherwin, you'll see some of my presentations there. Oh, and the Canardly dog, that was a Kent Hovine thing. Yeah, oh, uh, you, you got me on that. Yeah, I got that from Kent. Yes, and I'm just calling you out there. <laughs> okay, all right, Terry, did I cover it all? Yes, I believe so. Okay. Now we should hear the creepy voice.